Mark, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for jumping on. I really hope you've prepared yourself for your quick fire question and answer session. Right, let's fire in. First question. When you first arrived at Aberdeen, which player impressed you the most in training? So again, I had a little think about this one because I've been asked this before. And again, the one that jumps out for me was one that Craig Brown actually pointed out. It was a young Cammy Smith. Oh, really? so when I first came to Aberdeen, he was 15 and playing in the first team and uh, mixing it with the boys again and was one that was kind of marked the future. And again, his career maybe never hit the heights that we thought it was going to hit. But as a young boy, he had everything. He was kind of, again, he was he was a man. He, he'd already developed physically and was very good on the ball. And was, as I say, a 15-year-old boy that was kind of playing with men and didn't look out of place. And again, that was kind of the highest compliment we could give him at the time. But yeah, Cam Smith at, at that age was uh, really, really good and one that, Certainly, Craig Brown had kind of highlighted to me in my first day is look, keep an eye on him and we've kind of got high hopes. Who did you sit beside in the dressing room? So, I don't know if this was a reflection on me or just a reflection of how the change room was, but they actually sat me next to a pillar. <laughs> um, so, the right hand side, it was just a pillar. So, I couldn't speak to them. But on the left hand side, kind of my latter days was Kenny McLean. So, okay. he's the only one I can really remember sitting next to, which probably says a lot about the ones that I previously sat next to. So, yeah, Kenny was the one that, so kind of pillar to my right, Kenny to my left. So, I, Kenny was a great lad. In and about the changing room, um, great player, but I one that you really want to have one of those characters that was always getting involved in, in everything, and uh, I really kind of set the, the, the temperature and the kind of the environment of the changing room as well. What was the best thing about being a captain? So again, the bit for me, and again, I've, I've thought about this before because it, it's something that I've, I've kind of obviously worn an armband at several clubs. But the biggest thing and the best thing for me being a captain is just wearing it out on the pitch. I think on a Saturday, which is the most important day of the week, is just getting to lead the boys out and, uh, and be the one to kind of, as I say, lead them out, especially like a couple of Aberdeen getting to go out and, and kind of lead those boys out and, and enjoy the successes that we did. And it makes it a little bit special when you're, you're wearing the armband as well. What's the worst thing about being a captain? So again, I, again, I was never officially a captain at Aberdeen. I, I was obviously captain at Dundee United when uh, we get promoted there um, at the Championship but I was uh, Russell's vice-captain at Aberdeen and uh, I kind of got to do the best bit of being a, without actually being a captain so I got to wear the armband the worst thing at the captain is probably everything else is that all the admin you don't see behind the scenes is sorting tickets for games is sorting hospitalities is getting boys to go to functions is getting guys to appear at appearances and just all that kind of general dog's body work so that's the bit that probably you don't enjoy but I was lucky at Aberdeen that I got to for Russell's last year when he was kind of injured, he, uh, he'd done all that behind the scenes stuff and was like my PA and I got to just wear the armband and, and get all the glory on the pitch. <laughs> Favourite pre-match meal? I know, so again, tough one. Pre-match is probably my most hated meal um, and something when I do eventually retire, I will not miss at all. So it changed from day to day or from game to game. Um Chicken and pasta was always a big one. Again, when you're, you're going down to play a Celtic or a Rangers at half 12 and you've stayed over in a hotel and it's maybe half nine, ten o'clock and you're sitting to a plate of chicken and pasta, it's not as enjoyable as, as you would hope it would be. Um, again, towards the, the kind of later stages of my career, I was more just a bowl of porridge, but I porridge with some, some honey in it and then some fruit and nuts and um, I just all the good things. So I, I tried to get a bit lighter, but back in the day, it was, I, was a, I was a standard chicken and pasta, a bit of tomato sauce, and we just smashed that in me, but I didn't enjoy it at all. Okay. Um, funniest prank that you ever saw during your time at Pataudry? So there's, again, there was a, a, a few, a lot of good pranks. Again, I don't know what audience this goes out to. Um, so a few of them probably can't be broadcast. And uh, a few of the guys that partook in the pranks probably don't want you, their names being associated to it. Um, I'm sure if you search about it, you'll find a few of the stories linking about. But one of, one of my favourites was uh, we ended up on, I don't know who it was, but we ended up finding an app on the App Store called Message X, which basically, in a nutshell, you would download the app and for, it was like five pounds a message, you could send a message to a mobile number from any mobile number. Right. So I could, I could send you a message from Danny McInnes and your phone would come up, and if you guys never saved, it would say, Derek McInnes has sent you a message, and it would look like he'd sent you a message for all intents and purposes. So we uh, we downloaded that app, and I, for about a month, had a great time just messaging boys to go and meet the manager, or messaging the, I think it was the time, he messaged him to go and meet the chairman in the boardroom, because he wanted to resign, messaged the chairman to say that he needed to speak to him, and it was, I uh, just used to see people flying about, to the point that all the club phones actually got confiscated, thought they'd been so that was again probably the cleanest that I can tell you and I certainly one of the best because we had a 
we had a, a bit of fun with that for a good few weeks. Who had the best car? I know, so, but again, we weren't really big into cars. I think Johnny Hayes was one that always kind of liked these, these kind of big high powered Audis. But again, the best car for me, and again, maybe that shows you the boy from Motherwell and then a guy that's an adopted Aberdonian, but Jamie Langfield, when I first signed, had the Mercedes, two, we two see our Mercedes sports car, GLA or GLC, whatever it was, like, like a, a wee fancy wee car, didn't suit him at all. <laughs> Lovely car. And I, I remember asking, like, what is, what's the deal with the car? And it turned out he got the car for £99 a month. So I was always paying for it. So that was my favourite car, purely because I've never seen a car as good that you could get for £99 a month. So I was delighted that he could get that. I tried to get one myself, couldn't get it by. That was the, that was the best car I've ever come across, purely because, yeah, it was a nice car, but the bit that appeals to the model boy in me was it was the cheapest car I'd ever heard of him to get. Who was the best dancer in a nightclub? So there's a few. We did with a few boys that like to cut a shape. Like Adam Rooney, maybe surprise you. I loved it. I a bit awkward, but he uh, he could move. So I think uh, uh, he was one that enjoyed getting up and cutting a few shapes. <laughs> cutting a few shapes. And I'm sure that he'll, he'll definitely watch this and he'll definitely message me on the back of this morning that I brought that up. So who's winning a dance off? You or Shay Logan? Again, I've had the pleasure of Miss Pleasure to play Michelle at two clubs. Um, I get I she would win hands down. So again, she was probably the only man to give Adam Rooney about his money on the dance floor. Oh, really? uh, she can move. She's got some moves. As it, and it pains me to say that because again, he'll be watching this. And again, she's now working offshore. Yeah. Um, so I know he'll be showing all his guys offshore <laughs> that uh, that I've backed him up on this, and he'll probably be, be cutting a few moves offshore and a few of the platforms with the guys. Talking about Adam Rooney for his penalty against Inverness in the cup final. Did you have your eyes open or shut? I was an open. Yeah, I was watching him. Again, every faith in him. I can I couldn't I think there's one penalty I can remember Adam Rooney missing. And I couldn't even tell you who it was against. It was that and frequent by backed Adam. And again, Danny McKinnis was always mad when I was taking penalties and practicing. So no, fully backed Adam and fully expecting to score. I think I was on the first ones on his back after he scored because I was that hawkeye on the on the penalties. Was that your most memorable moment in an Aberdeen shirt? I, I think it would be, no, absolutely. Again, the uh, the 120 minutes that went before that, I've kind of blacked out. Um, wasn't oh, enjoyable no. at all. Uh, we don't really speak of that, but <laughs> I think as soon as that ball hit the back of the net, from that moment on for the next week was probably the most enjoyable. And again, just seeing how much it meant to the club, kind of the, the celebrations after it, again, the amount of fans we took to Parkhead, the amount of fans that were back at Aberdeen, the amount of fans in Union Street when we paraded the trophy, and um, was was amazing, and I certainly think that does stand alone as the best uh, moment in in our Al- Aberdeen career. Were you in line to take a penalty if needed? So an interesting story. I would I would say I was. I think if you asked Eddie McInnes and Tony Docherty, they probably say I was last in line. Um, so again, we I don't know if you remember, but we put Aloha was the team we played in the first round of that cup, and it ended up that I scored the winning penalty. Yeah. To get us through through a process of it was between me. Calvin Zola and Greg, who else was it? It wasn't Greg Tanzi. Can't mind who it was now, but it was basically me and Calvin Zola between the two of us, and uh, Calvin was not having it, so I get pushed forward, scored it, and uh, had had said at the final, um, Dan McKenzie was always keen on players wanting to take a penalty, so he would kind of go around and say, look, who's interested? And everybody put a hand up, and uh, I put my hand up, and he, he kind of just looked straight through me. So it was, uh, we'll try and find five other guys and thanks to the volunteers, but we're not going to use you. So to answer your question, long story short, yes, I was in line, but I think I was at the back of the line. Right, okay. Um, you scored seven goals for Aberdeen during your time at the club. What was your particular favourite? Well, it should have been hard because there's that, not that many to choose from. Um, I th- I'm probably going to say the, the Real Sociedad, um, just became the European game, big night. Um, we started that game really well scored I think that actually put us 1-0 up or 2-1 up um, with a kind of real impetus and we felt as though we were going to kind of maybe do something and get a real upset but I that one I enjoyed that one probably the most just for the occasion and again Real Sociedad are a huge European team as well So during your time with Aberdeen what was the best goal that you saw? So again there have been a few there's a few great goals but I think the one that probably stands out was James Madison's free kick against Rangers Yeah, yeah. again and I think 
the thing for us was again, I spoke to a few Aberdeen fans, what a few Aberdeen fans now who kinda remember the bedlam and, and the kind of limbs after that went in. But James Madison practiced that free kick or free kicks after training every day. He would hit 40, 50 free kicks. And again, for me, the thing that I always remember was he would score like 45, 46 out of 50. Like really? he would not miss. His technique was phenomenal. Like in terms of technical ability, probably the best player I've ever played with. Um, but practice, re- repeatability, would I uh, would smash them in. So we would all see him doing that. So when he stepped up against Rangers, we fancied him. That was like a penalty for us because we knew how good he was. But I think you just look at him, the age he was, the occasion, how much he meant to the fans. And again, just the, the sheer quality. I mean, it's literally the postage stamp. I think it it kisses the crossbar on the post going in the way in. And I, that was uh, I, that's that would stand alone as probably the best goal that I've seen. Graham Shinney also said he was the technically most gifted player that he played with. Yeah. Um, okay. Who are you winning an argument with? Derek McInnes or the Doc? I know. So I, I would always back myself in an argument, but the good thing with Derek and, and, uh, and Doc was we never really got into too many arguments. Or there was never really a winner. Um, we would save our peace and we would always kind of get to a, a resolution or we would kind of let it cool down and we come back and we make sure that we could kind of all said and done, we were, we were all sorted. So, again, two great managers. And again, I think perfect timing. You look at the, the short list for manager of the year. I think Derek won it and Tony Docherty was in the short list of three. So, yeah. two great managers, two guys, great to in the changing room, great to kind of for me to work under. Um, I, and again, maybe that's part of the success. There wasn't really, certainly between me, there wasn't really many two arguments. A lot of disagreements, a lot of kind of not agreeing on things or, or again, certainly with me wanting to play more than I was, maybe it was then. But we always kind of got a resolution. So, there was never really a need to be a winner, but I think if you asked Derek or Doc, they would always back themselves, so I'm going to back me and say I'd probably beat them both comfortably. Okay. And I'll... okay, right fella, final question and probably the most important one you will ever face. So, Bad Boys Inc or the Backstreet Boys? Oh, so. Oh, so. Ah, it's, a, oh. it's a tough question. Dude, I, th- I think I am the only, one of the only ones maybe you've interviewed that these came at different times in my life. So Backstreet Boys came when I was like 11, 12, 96, 97. Oh God, now you make me feel old. So I think you came 93, 92, 93, 94 maybe. So I was just about Correct. six or seven. So I think on the basis that as a six, seven, you know, there wasn't really any of my pop, but as a 10, 11, 12 year old, the Backstreet Boys were out there. So unfortunately, and I know uh, you've been, you were telling me before we come on that things haven't been going great, but <laughs> I'm going to go with the Backstreet Boys. I can't believe it. What a way to finish, fella. I can't even believe it. He's been a close second. A few great songs. I did go on and listen. I've downloaded a few of your songs. So if you oh, notice, have you? your Spotify's went up by one listener. That's, that'll be me. Excellent. Excellent. That'll add 0.0001 penny in the pound to my royalties for this year. Yeah, I'll keep listening. I'll try and get that up to at least 5p. Mate, top man. Thank you so much. Cheers, Ali. Thank you. All right, fella. Take care.